Welcome back to Plato's Republic. Today we're going to finish up Book 4 of the Republic. If you're just joining us, you probably don't want to start with Book 4. You probably want to start with Book 1. Uh, check out the description for a link to Book 1 and the entire playlist, which will have videos for all 10 books eventually. We're doing about one or two videos per book, so I think it's going to be about 20 videos in total. Uh, kind of a lot of content we're cranking out here, but it's what it takes to read an entire book on YouTube. All right, so in the last video, the beginning of book four, we had uh, Socrates kind of finish up, we think, his uh, hypothetical city. And he kind of hands it over to, we're, we're talking about the Guardians in particular. And he starts out the book, uh, or actually Glaucon starts out kind of objecting to how the Guardians are being treated. And uh, in particular, he says, like, look, the the guardian, like you call them guardians, and they sound really cool, like they're the most important people in the city. But you don't let them have any private property. Uh, you don't even let them have like their own wife. Uh, you don't let them have gold. You lie to them and tell them that if they die in battle, it'll be good, or they shouldn't actually fear death. Uh, and then you tell them these other lies, like their education took place in the center of the earth, and the earth is their mother. And then we have this other lie for the entire society, which is one of the most fascinating concepts in all of political philosophy. Um, and the particular lie is that we have uh, people who are made of gold and silver and iron and bronze. And sometimes if a gold child is born to silver parents, you need to take the child away so that it can grow up to be a guardian. Uh, that's the... Uh, that, uh, Myth is introduced in book three, but then it's kind of validated in book four. Uh, so at first, Socrates is like, oh, well, here's just an example of a myth. And then by book four, he's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're definitely baby snatching here uh, for, the, for the greater good. And it's a fascinating concept more generally is do, do you need to lie to the people in order to keep the city together? Uh, does, does a nation state depend on some kind of noble lie or magnificent myth? Um, and maybe, maybe it does. It's certainly worth pondering. Uh, we don't like to think about kind of the founding crimes of a nation. So even a country like the United States, uh, which people like to think of as being good, uh, but it's, it's hard to get around basically the ethnic cleansing that took place on the entire continent uh, in order to, to start a country like that. And we have kind of myths about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and cowboys and Indians and bringing law uh, to the continent. Um, but maybe maybe we really need these things to be... We need, maybe we need the myths to be true. And if we were demoralized uh, by the crimes themselves, then maybe the nation wouldn't hold together as well. Um, and it's, it's a big thing that just comes up over and over. Uh, we don't... We can't almost can't tolerate threats to our national mythology. And some ideas um, are almost instantly rejected as a threat to the national mythology. So it's it's a really fascinating uh, concept. I think with a lot of relevance today, if you step back and think, uh, what what are the ideas that you're not allowed to say today? Is it because they're a threat uh, to mythology and possibly a threat to national identity? And is that why you're not allowed to say it rather than? Uh, having to do with the particular historical facts. So uh, so he goes through and finishes up this uh, city, and he says that the city is going to have uh, wisdom and courage and temperance as its virtues. So he kind of presents the city to Glaucon and says, here, here, I've built the city for you. See if you can find these three things. And if we find those three things, then surely this fourth characteristic, justice, will also be present. And so they go through and they say, yeah, well, it's, it's a wise city because the Guardians are making all the right choices. It's a courageous city because the Guardians are courageous. It's a, it's a temperate city because everyone agrees that the Guardians should be in charge. It's uh, Temperance uh, has to do with kind of internal harmony in this conception. And so sort of thereby, he argues that justice must be near. And I love the, the visual imagery he had around hunting justice. So he's like on the tracks of temperance, and then they're in the woods. He's like, oh, Glaucon, I think justice is nearby. I can, I, I see the tracks. It's dark, but follow me. I, th I think we're almost there. I just, I love that, uh, just psychologically with, with Socrates as kind of your leader through the darkness. 
and eventually he gets close to saying that there's justice there, um, and he makes this argument that it's a kind of this weird argument about the, um, I guess, undermining the city would be the greatest injustice, and that we, because the greatest injustice is not present, therefore the greatest justice, or therefore justice must be present. Um, and, and, and the undermining in particular, you remember, is like having these people change jobs. So he's like, okay, we can't have the shoemakers trading their tools with the, you know, the potters. Like, that will lead to utter chaos, because then we just have these crappy potters. Um, and similarly, if we allowed that, then some people would kind of bribe their way into being guardians, and then we'd have bad guardians, and the city would collapse. Um, so it's, it's really about kind of separation based on professions, which has been a, a recurring theme throughout the entire Republic. And so, so that's kind of the argument that he makes for why justice is present, because we've banned that kind of interchange, um, and yeah, new career seeking, uh, for, at least for adults, uh, in this ideal city. And that's it. But he says he's not quite satisfied with that, so he still really wants to find justice in another way. And that's what we're about to start. So he's he's saying um, that that sort of proves that there's justice at the societal level. And once again, we have individual level justice and city level justice. So he says we have city level justice because no one's changing jobs. And do we have individual justice? Now we're going to go try to find that individual justice, which we've been seeking uh, this entire time from the very, the very first book of the Republic. And the way I think the argument is proceeding, we just ended the last video where he starts talking about the nature of the soul and how it's divided into these three classes, I think mirroring the division of the city-state into the complete guardians, the auxiliary guardians, and kind of everybody else. And... Well, it's, he just keeps constantly looking back and forth. So he says, we're going to compare, we're going to look at the city and the individual side by side and see if we can find the same things um, there. Kind of a weird idea, but also kind of makes sense. And it's, it's, a, it's a recurring metaphor uh, for uh, political life just throughout history is everybody working together to form this larger organism. Um, Okay, and it's, so it's and it's never about individual happiness. It's like you, it's all about the greater organism. So some, sometimes we gotta we gotta make some sacrifices. Uh, it's like sorry, pinky finger that got stuck in a boat door. I don't know what. Okay. Um, all right. So let's so let's go ahead and start. Let's get back to uh, to book four here. Get comfortable. Get a beverage. And uh, turn to, I don't know what page this is, but if you can just search for the phrase, well, you amazing fellow, and you can follow along at home. All right. Socrates says, well, you amazing fellow, here's another trivial investigation we have stumbled into. <laughs> His investigations are never trivial. Does the soul have these three kinds of things in it or not? So I think that's wisdom, courage, and temperance. Is that right? Yeah, temperate, courage, courageous, and wise. So, okay, does, does the soul have these three things? Glaucon, it does not look at all trivial to me. Perhaps, Socrates, there is some truth in the old saying that everything beautiful is difficult. Hmm. So, I, I kind of like that saying. I, I don't think I'd heard it before. Every, everything beautiful is difficult. Yeah. No, no easy Instagram pictures here. Socrates, apparently so. In fact, you should be well aware, Glaucon, that it is my belief we will never ever grasp this matter precisely by methods of the sort we are now using in our discussions. Okay, we got, we're going to have new methods introduced here. However, oh boy, there is in fact another longer and more time-consuming road that does lead there. But perhaps we can manage to come up to the standard of our previous statements and inquiries. Okay, we've got we're gonna have a new method to come up to the same standard as the old method. So I, I guess we've been using this Socratic method, although it's really just being 
So far, the Socratic method here in book three is just like, and it must be this, right? And Glaucon says, like, yes, surely. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like an abuse of the Socratic method. Glaucon, shouldn't we be content with that? It would be enough for me, at least for now. Socrates, well then, it will be quite satisfactory for me too. Glaucon, then do not weary, but go on with the inquiry. All right, here we go. Socrates, well, isn't it absolutely necessary for us to agree to this much, that the very same kinds of things and conditions exist in each one of us as exist in the city? After all, where else would they come from? You see, it would be ridiculous for anyone to think that spiritedness did not come to be in cities from the private individuals who were reputed to have this quality, such as the Thracians, Scythians, and others who lived to the north of us. Or that the same is not true of the love of learning, which is mostly associated with our part of the world. Or of the love of money, which is said to be found not least among the Phoenicians and the Egyptians. Okay, so he's saying all these qualities that are ascribed to cities really should be ascribed to the individuals who are in the cities. Which is sort of what he did before. Um, but kind of in reverse. So before he was saying, well, the city's wise because we have these wise rulers, or it kind of externally seems to make these wise decisions because individually they're, uh, they're wise people. Um, and yeah, okay, so he's saying same thing with uh, the Thracians who have, which quality do the Thracians have? Spiritedness. And then the Athenians have love of learning, but that's just because the individuals do, etc., etc. Okay. Glaucon, it certainly would. Socrates, we may take that as being so, then, and it was not at all difficult to discover. <laughs> yeah, that was an easy one. Softball. Glaucon, no, it certainly was not. Socrates, but now, this is difficult. Do we do each of them with the same thing? Or since there are three, do we do one with one and another with another? That is to say, do we learn with one, feel anger with another, and with yet a third have an appetite for the pleasures of food, sex, and those closely akin to them? Or we do each of them with the whole of our soul once we feel the impulse? Okay, so within a person, we have these three things going on. Are there three souls or one soul? That is what is difficult to determine in a way that is up to the standards of our argument. And... So we've, we've kind of had this idea introduced before a little bit when he's talking about how in these other non-ideal cities, you have, they're, they're really multiple cities in one. And you remember you had kind of the, the reasoned part had to command the appetites. Because uh, it's like the appetite just wants what the appetites want. And the reason's got to be like, no, 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 no. Okay, this is for the best of us that I'm in charge. I'm driving the car here. You stay in the back. Uh, so now we're splitting it up, not into two parts, but to three parts. So we got the learning, anger, and appetite. Yeah. Socrates, well then, let's try in this way to determine whether they are the same as one another or different. Glaucon, what way? Socrates, it is clear that the same thing cannot do or undergo opposite things. Not at any rate, in the same respect, in relation to the same thing at the same time. So, if we ever find it happening here, we will know that we are not dealing with one and the same thing, but with many. So I think he's what he's saying here, is that undergoing, do or undergoing. Okay, so it's like, if you are simultaneously learning and indulging your appetite for food, sex, etc., then those must be separate parts of your soul doing that. Yeah, so ang angry sex, if you're having angry sex, that means that it's really two parts of your soul operating. Talking. All right. Socrates, consider then what I'm about to say. Glaucon, say it. Is it possible for the same thing at the same time and in the same respect to be standing still and moving? Ah. Uh, Glaucon, not at all. What if it's rotating? Think about that. Socrates, let's come to a more precise agreement in order to avoid disputes later on. You see, if anyone said of a person who is standing still but moving his hands and head, that same thing is moving and standing still at the same time, 
We would not consider, I imagine, that he should say that. <laughs> well, that's basically what I was saying. But rather than in one respect the person standing still, while in another respect he is moving. Isn't that so? It is. Then, if the one who said this became still more charming and made the sophisticated point that spinning tops, at any rate, stand still as a whole and the same time they are also in motion, what was I? Di what did I just say? Spinning tops. Key to the, the key to the whole thing. When, with the peg fixed in the same place they revolve, or that the same holds of anything that moves in a circle in the same spot, we would not agree on the grounds that in such situations it is not in the same respects that these objects are both moving and standing still. On the contrary, we would say that these objects have both a straight axis and a circumference in them. Yeah, ro rotational momentum and, what is it? rectilinear momentum and and that with respect to the straight axis they stand still since they do not wobble to either side whereas with respect to the circumference they move in a circle but if their straight axis wobbles to the left or right or front or back at the same time as they are spinning we will say that they are not standing still in any way okay so he's he's basically just spelling out like ro rotational momentum here so you have a spinning top and in one in one respect, it's not moving at all. In the other, we say that it is. So he's just, I guess he's just saying you gotta clarify what the different axes are. Get a little more precise with your definitions. Because, like, moving isn't just a singular concept. Falcon, and we would be right. Socrates, no such objection will disturb us then, or make us any more likely to believe the same thing can, at the same time, in the same respect, and in relation to the same thing, Undergo, be, or do opposite things. Okay, so he's, I guess he's saying, like, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say to be standing still and moving at the same time, and then someone comes along and says, what about a spinning top? And he says, well, okay, at this, in the same respect and in relation to the same thing. So it's, yeah, you, you gotta, like, break down your axes, I guess, or get, get more specific about doing the same thing at the same time. Glaucon, that won't have that effect on me, at least. Socrates, all the same. In order to avoid going through all these objections, one by one, and taking a long time to prove them all untrue... <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, like, fleshing this argument out at the academy or whatever. He's like, we wouldn't say you can stand still and move at the same time. And then some student's like, what about a top? He's like, well, I'm not going to respond to all these individually. Dang it. You darn sophists. Let's hypothesize that what we have said is correct and carry on, with the understanding that if it should ever be shown to be incorrect, all the consequences we have drawn from it will be invalidated. Thank you so much. Isn't it rare to see that these days? People make arguments, and they never say, well, okay, if this is, if this is true, everything else falls apart. They're just like, I feel like this, and I feel like this, and here's a pattern. Don't you agree with the pattern? And you're like, well, this is wrong. They're like, well, the pattern still holds. You're like, this is also wrong. Like, well, the pattern still holds. Like, this is also wrong. Like, well, well, well. I don't know. It's, it's kind of refreshing to see. It's like, if one thing falls apart, everything collapses. And it's, 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 I think it's much more like reality, how reality works. It's like computer programs. I'm a computer programmer. If I make one mistake in the entire program, all bets are off. Like, it, the whole thing will crash. Nothing works. Same thing with, like, a car. You screw up one little part on it, like, oh, we just didn't tighten the flange nut on the brakes properly. You don't have brakes anymore. Uh, it's, this, is, this is how it should be. This is like saying everything hinges on this one thing. Okay, so I, I like Socrates for that. He's willing to just, like, put, like, put it all on this one concept. Um, which, yeah, it, is this idea, you, like, you can't be doing two things at, at once, like, your soul can't pat its belly and rub its head at the same time. I guess. Glaucon, yes, that's what we should do. Socrates, now, wouldn't you consider assent and dissent, wanting to have something and rejecting it, taking something and pushing it away, as all being pairs of mutual opposites, whether of opposite doings or of opposite undergoings, does not matter? Yes, they are pairs of opposites. What about thirst, hunger, and appetites as a whole, and also wishing and willing? Would you include all of them somewhere among the kinds of things we just mentioned? For example, 
Wouldn't you say that the soul of someone who has an appetite wants the thing for which it has an appetite, and draws toward itself what it wishes to have? And in addition, that in so far as his soul wishes something to be given to it, it nods assent to itself, as if in question, as if in answer to a question, and strives toward its attainment. Yeah, gimme, gimme, gimme. All right, your soul wants something, or your appetite wants something, but then, what about the opposite? Maybe, maybe your reason doesn't want it. What about not willing, not wishing, and not having an appetite? Wouldn't we include them among the very opposites, cases in which the soul pushes and drives things away from itself? Of course. Since that is so, won't we say that there is a kind of consisting of appetites and that the most conspicuous examples of them are what we call hunger and thirst? We will. Isn't the one for food the other for drink? How could it be any other way? Yes. Now, in so far as it is, as it is thirst, is it an appetite in the soul for more than what we say it is for? I mean, is thirst a thirst for hot drink or cold? Or much drink or little, or in a word, for drink of a certain sort. Uh, yeah, it's like, are you hungry for, like, when you're hungry, are you hungry for, like, a Taco Bell chalupa specifically, or are you just hungry? Or isn't it rather that if heat is present in addition to thirst, it causes the appetite to be for something cold as well, whereas the addition of cold makes it an appetite for something hot? And if there is much thirst, because of the presence of muchness, won't it cause the desire to be for much drink and where, where little for little? But thirst itself will never be for anything other than the very thing that is in its nature to be an appetite for. Namely, drink itself. Similarly, hunger is for food. Okay, do you, do you follow that argument? He's saying, you're really just hungry, but then if there's something else nearby, then you, that desire becomes more specific. So it's like, you, are, you really are just hungry, and then there's a Taco Bell nearby, so then you're hungry also for Taco Bell. Um, or like, you're thirsty... And it's hot outside, so you're, you think you're thirsty for a cold lemonade, but really the underlying uh, appetite is thirst for anything. Glaucon, that's the way it is. By itself, at any rate, each appetite is for its natural object only, while an appetite for an object of this or that sort depends on additions. Socrates, no one should catch us unprepared, then, or disturb us by claiming that no one has an appetite for drink, but rather for good drink, nor for food, but rather for good food, since everyone's appetite is for good things. And so if thirst is an appetite, it will be an appetite for good drink or good whatever, and similarly for the other appetites. Okay, so he's saying, in the general case, if like you're not just hungry for Taco Bell, you have a hunger, but... Uh, the exception is for good things. Everybody wants good, like, no one wants a bad, no one's, like, hungry for a bad pizza. Um, so we don't, we don't want to be caught unprepared for that argument. Glaucon, yes, there might seem to be something in that objection. But surely, Socrates says, whenever things are related to something, those that are of a particular sort are related to a particular sort of thing, as seems to me, whereas those that are just themselves are related only to a thing that is just itself. Glaucon, I do not understand. I don't understand either. Don't you understand that the greater is such as to be greater than something else? The greater is such as to be greater... Okay, so if we say something is the greater, we're saying it must be in relation to the thing that it's greater than. Of course. Than the less? Yes. And the much greater than the much less. Isn't that so? Why, yes. And the once greater than the once less. And the going to be greater than the going to be less. Okay, certainly. And doesn't the same hold of the more in relation to the fewer, the double to the half, and everything of the sort? This is basically all adjectives are relative. And also of heavier to lighter and faster to slower, and in addition, of hot to cold, and also other similar things? This is a very important concept, that, like, all adjectives are relative. Because you're like, how long is a million years? Is that a long time or a short amount of time? It's like, well, in relation to my life, that's a long time. But, like, in relation to the moon being around, kind of a short amount of time. Uh, I, think, I think time being long or short is all relative to how long it takes to complete a thought. That, that's my own personal theory. If you had a computer 
that took like a thousand years to complete a thought, it would think that a hundred years was a very short amount of time. All right, but that's that's my own little insertion. Okay, so yeah, same with hot and cold, lighter and heavier, everything else, double and half. Falcon, yes indeed. Socrates, what about the various kinds of knowledge? Aren't they the same way? Knowledge itself is what can be learned itself, or whatever we should take the object of knowledge to be, whereas any particular sort of knowledge of a particular sort is of a particular thing of a particular sort. I mean something like this. When knowledge of building houses was developed, it differed from the other kinds of knowledge, and so was called knowledge of building. Isn't that so? Okay, so he's saying, it's kind of like, are these things measurable? Like, hot and cold are measurable, size is measurable, fast and slow measurable, uh, is knowledge measurable? And he's saying, well, knowledge isn't really measurable here. Or we, we say, I guess, general knowledge is measurable, but then we have these particular sorts of measurable. So I don't know how to compare knowledge of building things to like knowledge of pottery or knowledge of renaissance music all right glaucon of course and wasn't that because it was a different sort of knowledge from all the others yes and wasn't it because it was a of a particular sort of thing that it itself became a particular sort of knowledge and isn't this true of all the crafts and sciences Okay, so it's it's like specialized knowledge because there's a specialized thing that the knowledge has to be about. It is. Well then, you should think of that as what I wanted to get across before, if you understand it now. When I said that whenever things are related to something, those that are just themselves are related to things that are just themselves, whereas those of a particular sort are related to things of a particular sort. And I do not mean at all that the sorts and questions in question have to be the same for both of them, that the knowledge of health and disease is healthy and diseased, or that of good and bad things is good and bad. On the contrary, I mean that when knowledge is occurred that was not just knowledge of the thing itself that knowledge is of, but of something of a particular sort, which in this case was health and disease, the result that it, it itself became a particular sort of knowledge, that this caused it to be no longer simply knowledge, but with the addition of the particular sort medical knowledge. You follow all that? I didn't really. Um, so, okay, so we have this specialized knowledge, and that knowledge becomes of a specialized thing. It does not become whatever, like if you have knowledge of a good thing, that doesn't make the knowledge good, right? It's just still just knowledge of a good thing. Um, like, if you have knowledge of a good baseball player, that doesn't make you a good baseball player or it doesn't make the knowledge play baseball well. And I, yeah, so I think it's getting back to this, like, compound nature of thirst, or being hungry for Taco Bell. All right, Falcon, I understand and think you're right. Socrates, returning to thirst, then, wouldn't you include it among the things that are related to something just by being what they are? Surely thirst is related to... dot, dot, dot. Glaucon, I would... It is related to drink. Socrates. So, a particular sort of thirst is for a particular sort of drink. Thirst itself, however, is not, not for much or little, good or bad, or in a word, for drink of a particular sort. Rather, thirst itself is, by nature, just for drink itself. Right? Glaucon. Absolutely. Socrates. Hence the soul of the thirsty person, insofar as it is simply thirsty, does not want anything else except to drink, and this is what it longs for, and is impelled to do. Okay, just, I'll take, it, I'll take anything you got. If you don't have Taco Bell, parties will be just fine. Glaucon, clearly. Then, if anything in it draws it back when it is thirsty, wouldn't it be something different from what thirsts and, like a beast, drives it to drink? For surely we say the same thing in the same respect of itself in relation to the same thing, and at the same time cannot do opposite things. Okay, so we've got... Yeah, if, if, you have, if you're thirsty but you're not something stopping you from drinking, then there must be two things operating within you.
is what he's saying. Got, got the angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other. Glauca, no, it cannot. Socrates, in the same way, I imagine, it's not right to say of the archer that his hands at the same time push the bow away and draw it toward him. On the contrary, we should say that one hand pushes it away while the other draws it toward him. Absolutely. Now, we would say, wouldn't we, that some people are thirsty, sometimes yet unwilling to drink? Many people often are. What then should one say about them? Isn't it that there is an element in their soul urging them to drink and also stopping them, something different that masters the one doing the urging? I certainly think so. Doesn't the element doing the stopping in such cases arise when it does arise from rational calculation? while the things that drive and drag are present because of feelings and diseases. Glaucon, apparently so. It would not be unreasonable for us to claim, then, that there are two elements different from one another, and to call the element in the soul with which it calculates the rationally calculating element, and the one with which it feels passion, hungers, thirsts, and is stirred by other appetites, the irrational appetite of element, friend to certain ways of being filled and certain pleasures. All right, so you got the rational element in your brain and the irrational appetite of element. I think we can all relate to those. It's like, yeah, I really, like, I don't want to eat a donut because it's going to make me fat, but I do want to eat a donut. Well, okay, no, it would not. Indeed, it would be a very, a very natural thing for us to do. Socrates, let's assume, then, that we have distinguished these two kinds of elements in the soul. Now, is the spirited element the one with which we feel anger, a third kind of thing, or is it the same in nature as one of the others? Glaucon, as the appetitive element, perhaps. Socrates, but I once heard a story and believe it. Okay, so Glaucon's like, anger is really just an appetite. Like, <laughs> I've, got, you've, I've got bloodlust. Socrates says, Leontius, the son of Algion, was going up from Piraeus along the outside of the north wall when he saw some corpses with the public executioner nearby. He had an appetite of desire to look at them, but at the same time he was disgusted and turned himself away. Yeah, it's like morbid curiosity. Is that an appetite? For a while he struggled and put his hand over his eyes, but finally, mastered by his appetite, he opened his eyes wide and rushed toward the corpses, saying, Look for yourselves, you evil wretches. Take your fill of the beautiful sight. It's such a dark story. Wow. He's like, do I look? Do I not? All right, let's look. Glaucon, I have also heard that story myself. Socrates, yet surely the story suggests that anger sometimes makes war against the appetites as one thing against another. Glaucon, yes, it does suggest that. Socrates, and don't we often notice on other occasions that when appetite forces someone contrary to his rational calculation, he reproaches himself and feels anger at the thing in him that is doing the forcing? And just as if there were two warring factions, such a person's spirit becomes the ally of his reason. But, spirit, partnering the appetites to do what reason has decided should not be done, I do not imagine you would say you had ever seen that, either in yourself or anyone else. Okay, so if the ap like if the appetite wins, you feel anger, and let's see if there were two warring factions, a person's spirit becomes the ally of his reason. The spirit partnering the appetites to do what reason has decided should not be done. I guess partnering with the appetites. Okay, so we're saying anger is always on reason's side, I think. So if, like, appetites and reason are fighting and appetites win, then you're angry. So, like, that shows you anger is on reason's side. And the anger... Okay, but we never see anger... There's <laughs> What are you saying? Is there's, there's no such thing as hangry. I, I think that's what he's saying. So uh, hunger, like, appetites and anger are never on the same side. It's like, all right, hanger is going to overcome reason. Um, I guess, yeah, I, I guess that's what he's he means here. We've, we've never seen anger 
an appetites get together and be like, I'm gonna like hate eat this and show show reason what's what. I guess. Glauca, no by Zeus I would not. Socrates. What about when a person thinks he is doing some injustice? Alright, now we're getting back to it. Isn't it true that the nobler he is, the less capable he is of feeling angry if he suffers hunger, cold, or the like at the hands of someone who, whom he believes to be inflicting this on him justly? And won't his spirit, as I say, refuse to be aroused? Okay, so it's like, if you're put in jail because you actually did it, then you can't be too angry about it. He's like, dude, you did the crime. And you're like, oh well, yeah, alright, I'm not going to be pissed. I'm going to find my peace. Glaucon. It is true. But what about when a person believes he's being unjustly treated? Doesn't his spirit boil then, and grow harsh, and fight as an ally of what he holds to be just? And even if it suffers hunger, cold, and every imposition of that sort, doesn't it stand firm and win out over them, not ceasing its noble efforts until it achieves its purpose, or dies like a dog called to heal by a shepherd, and is called back by the reason alongside it, and becomes gentle? Okay, so it's like... If you're falsely accused or, like, wrongfully imprisoned, then you're pissed. You've got, like, righteous anger on your side. Uh, and, let's see. If it suffers hunger and every imposition sort of doesn't stand out firm. So you're just like, all right, yeah, all right, you've sent me to Siberia. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to get through this hunger and cold. You're not going to kill my spirit here. I'm going to be pissed until my last day about this. I think that's what he means. Glaucon, your simile is perfect. And in fact, we did put the auxiliaries in our city to be like obedient sheepdogs for the city's shepherd-like rulers. Yeah, I remember their their dog-like nature has been mentioned a few times, where they had they got to be like spirited and tender. That's that's kind of where it started. And o obedient sheepdogs. Socrates. You've understood what I was trying to say very well. But have you also noticed something else about it? Glaucon, what? Socrates, that it is the opposite of what we recently thought about the kind of thing spirit is. You see, we thought of it as something appetitive. But now, far from saying that, we say that in the faction that takes place in the soul, it's far more likely to take arms on the side of the rationally calculating element. Yeah, righteous anger. Not appetitive, not hungry... Not hungry anger, righteous anger. That's what wins. Glaucon, absolutely. Socrates, is it also different from this then? Or is it some kind of rationally calculating element so that there are not three kinds of things in the soul but two? The rationally calculating element and the appetite of one. Or rather, just as there were three classes in the city that held it together, the money-making, the auxiliary, and the deliberative, is there also this third element in the soul, the spirited kind, which is the natural auxiliary of the rationally calculating element if it has not been corrupted by bad upbringing? Okay, so are we saying is that anger, does it actually belong to reason, or is it a third thing? And this whole discussion, like, I don't know what they mean. I don't know how you prove one thing or the other. Like, I'm going along with this, but it mostly just seems like, a, like, Unless you're dissecting a brain, this just seems like a word game to me. Like, oh, well, is it the same or are they different? Like, I don't know. Like, this whole thing, <laughs> I think this whole thing is a little bit meaningless, but I see why they could think, like, short of having any, like, modern neuroscience, I could kind of see why they, why they, like, how, how this is the only way to try, like, try to get at the nature of our brains. Um, but it's completely unobservable, so... I don't know how useful this actually is, besides providing a nice metaphor and providing, maybe providing more of that magnificent lie and noble, no, magnificent myth and noble lie. So it's like, it's sort of like in the earlier, in the earlier books, I was saying that we haven't pointed out the role of error here. And then one of my possible conclusions was that it's okay for the people in charge to make errors as long as everyone believes that they don't. So maybe it's okay for these accounts of the soul to be incorrect as long as everybody believes that they're true. So that's that's like the one way I could go along with this. Be like, yeah, okay, sure. Like this is this is useful propaganda. If everybody believes they have a soul with three parts and that that reinforces the concept of the city which is divided into three parts and that confers legitimacy on our city, then maybe it's like 
sure, this is these are just more useful lies uh, for the people to believe. So, like, in that sense, sure, I'll go along with it. All right, Glaucon, there must be a third. Socrates, yes, provided at any rate that it can be shown to be as distinct from the rationally calculating element as it was shown to be from the appetite of one. Glaucon, oh, he's taking the reins here. But it is not difficult to show that. After all, one can see it even in small children. They're full of spirit right from birth. But as for rational calculation, some of them seem to me never to possess it, while the masses do so quite late. Yes, by Zeus, you put that really well. Besides, one can see in animals that what you say is true. But, in addition to that, our earlier quotation from Homer also bears it out. He struck his chest and spoke to his heart. You see it, and you see in Homer, in it, Homer clearly presents what he is cal what calculated, well, was clearly presents what has calculated about better and worse, what has been calculated, what he has calculated. I don't know some some kind of typo here, rebuking what is irrationally angry as though it were something different. Okay, so he's this is like Homer struck his chest, beat it, and spoke to his heart. So he's like, yeah, look, those are two different things. Like, if your heart is the same as your head, then why would you why would you speak to your heart? How about that? What are you going to say to that? Glaucon, that's exactly right. Socrates, well, we've had a difficult swim through all that, and we were pretty much agreed that at the same classes as are in the city, as are in the city are in the soul of each individual and an equal number of them too. What are the odds? How do we know there aren't more? That's true. Then doesn't it already necessarily follow that the private individual is wise in the same way and because of the same element as the city? Of course. I, I know some individuals who are not wise or courageous or temperate. And that the city is courageous in the same way because of the same element as the private individual. And that in everything else that pertains to virtue, both are alike. Necessarily. And so, Glaucon, I take it we will also say that a man is just in exactly the same way as is a city. No inner, like, no changing of jobs within himself. No job changes, please. That too falls with absolute necessity. Socrates, but we sh surely have not forgotten that the city was just because each of the three classes in it does its own work. I do not think we have forgotten it. We should also bear in mind, then, that in the case of each one of us as well, the one in whom each of the elements does its own job will be just and do his own job. Do your own job. Stay in your place. Don't be an entrepreneur. Glaucon, certainly. Then, isn't it appropriate for the rationally calculating element to rule since it is really wise and exercises foresight on behalf of the whole soul, and for the spirited kind to obey it and be its ally? Of course. Now, as we were saying, isn't it a mixture of musical and physical training that makes these elements concordant, tightening and nurturing the first with fine words and learning, while relaxing, soothing, and making gentle the second by means of harmony and rhythm? Hmm. Okay, I do just want to pause briefly here. I think part of the genius of relating the individual to the state, being like, you have three elements in you, just like the state has three elements, it really confers legitimacy on the state. Again, I was talking... Uh, the previous video is about the importance of identity to persuasion. So we saw the very first book, Polemarchus, is not persuaded by arguments that threaten his identity as a good person. So it's like, we're talking about justice, a just person is a thief. He's like, no, that can't be. Uh, he's like, a just person might not know who his real friends are. Polemarchus is like, no, that can't be. And he's like, oh, well, a just person doesn't want to harm people because it makes them less just. And he's like, by gosh, that's persuasive to me. Uh, I think it's this, it's, it, it, the same sort of identity argument shows up here. I think this is such a powerful concept, not because it's true, but because it relates, it redefines our personal identity. I say, I have an identity of a person with three parts of my soul, this appetite and this reason and this spiritedness. And because I relate to that personally, I'm more likely to believe that the city that is similarly composed, almost because I just like things that look like me, um, is, le is legitimate, is 
properly constituted because it's just like almost a, it appeals not quite to my own vanity but at least to my own self conception um and i i think that's how so much actually works and not, not with the argument about the soul but if you think for example i don't know like i am i identify as an american like i was born in the united states and i've just kind of kept the label around and the way I, because I've been kind of thoroughly propagandized is like, you're an American. Americans believe in freedom and they're good people. Say, yeah, yeah, I'm a good person. I'm an American. And then kind of by extension, I'm willing to believe all these things about the, uh, the government, which rationally speaking makes no sense. Like, I think I'm a good person. I'm an American. I think people like America as a city, conceived as a city state, must also be a good person good person and do good things um and that's only only because of the identity because of identity it's only because of almost the flag and then say oh like an american would never like you read about these terrible things like we did in vietnam people don't want to look at it because they're like oh americans would never do that like well no here's the uh, here's the documentary evidence ah oh, america americans wouldn't do that. that's not what america's about it's you're only saying that because you think that you would not do that and you try to extend that, or you kind of plaster that identity of yourself onto these other people who have the same name as you or the same label as you. Rationally, it makes no sense. But this is this is what keeps the city state going. This is what keeps the national myth alive: is having individuals relate their own identity to that of the nation state or that of the city state, and then refuse to ascribe certain characteristics to the city. Because it's a, that would be a threat to their own identity. It's like, it's 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 ingenious, and it work like it certainly works. Um, so I I don't actually as I'm reading this, I don't know what was on Plato's mind. I don't know if he actually believed this theory of the soul. But as a like as propaganda, this is abs- this is like a plus grade A brilliant. If he can persuade everybody in the city that they have a soul with three parts, and that is mirrored by the three parts of this government. And that, by extension, I mean, here's, here's what's so persuasive about it, is that you think, oh, well, the Guardians, they can't make a mistake. They're reasonable people because I'm a reasonable person. I have the faculty, I have, like, this reason within me, and it contains the appetites. And therefore, the city must also be properly containing the appetites and doing the right thing and being virtuous. Although you can't actually know. I mean... You can make a mistake about that. They can make a mistake about that. That's that the role of error is never introduced here. Like we just look out. We compl- once once you're persuaded at the identity level, you just overlook any possibility that you're making a mistake or these other people are making a mistake or that you're just wrong about all of it. Um, all right. So enough of that tangent. But this is I find this even though the, normally I would think this chapter is really boring, but. Thinking of it as propaganda, I think, makes it completely fascinating. All right. I don't even remember where I was. Okay, enough about that. Uh, Let's get back to what he's saying about music and physical training, uh, which was the big subject in Book 3. He's saying a mixture of musical and physical training that makes these elements concordant. Okay, so it's... All right, it's the ideal education that makes the rational element and the spirited element get along, basically. Uh, tightening and nurturing the first with fine words and learning. So the first is the rational element. So they tighten and nurture the rational element with fine words and learning. While relaxing, soothing, and making gentle the second, so the spirited element, by means of harmony and rhythm. Okay, so this is, he's saying education kind of smooths out both the rational and the spirited element. You use fine words and learning to nurture the rational element. You use harmony and rhythm to relax, soothe, and make gentle the spirited element. So, okay, so it's kind of, you kind of, you're kind of taming the anger. <laughs> you're taming your anger with your uh, musical education. Glaucon, yes, exactly. Socrates, and these two elements, having been trained in this way and having truly learned their own jobs and been educated, will be put in charge of the appetite of element, the largest one in each person's soul and by nature the most insatiable for money. Yeah, it's, how are you going to feed them appetites? You're going to need some cash. 
They will watch over it to see that it does not get so filled with the so-called pleasures of the body that becomes big and strong and no longer does its own job but attempts to enslave and rule over the classes it is not fitted to rule, thereby overturning the whole life of anyone in whom it occurs. Okay, so he's saying you got your appetites, your reason, and your spirit, i.e. anger. So reason and spirit get together. They're two different things, but it's like, all right, they're going to team up and keep these appetites under control. Like, that's... You kind of, like, use your righteous anger to get hold of your appetites. All right. And it's... It kind of uses this language related to the city about enslaving and ruling over the class that's not fitted to rule. Like, the the appetite can't rule over your reason, or you'll just be a slob. Glaucon, yes, indeed. Socrates. And wouldn't these two elements also do the finest job of guarding the whole soul and body against external enemies, the one by deliberating, the other by fighting, following the ruler, and using its courage to carry out the things on which the former had decided. Okay, so it's reason, spirit are in charge. Reason's like, I'll figure out the plan. Spirit, you're the one who needs to go into battle. Glaucon, yes, they would. I imagine then that we call each individual courageous because of the latter part, that is, when the part of him that is spirited and kind preserves through pains and pleasures the pronouncement of reason about what should inspire terror and what should not. Okay. All right, so it's like your spirit is the thing that's got to be terrorized, and it's your reason that needs to decide it. This is actually pretty difficult, because you can kind of reason yourself about, like, this is... (laughs) Not to bring my dad into this again, but... He says, you know, it's like, you can hold on to, like, a really high-voltage wire as long as you don't touch the ground. Like, it won't actually electrocute you because the path of least resistance is through the wire and not through the ground if you're not touching the ground. So, like, a bird can land on, like, a high-voltage wire. My dad's like, I would never touch a high-voltage wire. And I'm like, I think it'd be fine. Like, you ran the calculations. You might as well... Like, the bird can do it. Why can't you do it? Like, what's... The, you should be able to hang from a high-voltage wire. And my dad's like, no, no, no. I'm, there's no way I'm... No way I'm doing that. You, you could not pay me enough to do that. Um, but that's that's kind of reason versus spiritedness here. Is would you touch the high-voltage wire? Or there's another great... Uh, there's a great YouTube video about, like, putting your fingers in molten lead. Like, if you get molten lead up to this precise temperature you can just like dip your fingers in water it's like 900 degrees fahrenheit and stick them in molten lead and nothing happens to your fingers and so reason tells you like the calculations say this is fine because the water kind of evaporate evaporates and creates this um layer like protective layer around your fingers essentially um but some people are like no there's you could not pay me enough money to do that ever um so socrates is saying you're courageous if you can listen to reason in that way. So if you're willing to touch the high voltage wire because your reason told you that it's okay to do, if you're willing to stick your fingers in the molten lead because reason said it's okay, then then that makes you a courageous individual. I agree. Glaucon, that's right. Socrates, but we call him wise, surely, because of the small part that rules in him, makes those pronouncements, and has within it the knowledge of what is advantageous both for each part and for the whole, the community composed of all three. Okay, so, all right, so remember, we're trying to find wisdom, courage, and temperance. We just found courage. Now, wisdom we found because whatever the, the small part that rules and makes pronouncements about, and yeah, has knowledge of what's advantageous. All right, so it's like you're, you're making good decisions because reason's in charge. Glocken, yes, indeed. Socrates, what about temperance? Isn't he temperate because of the friendly and concordant relations between these same things? Namely, when both the ruler and its two subjects share the belief that the rationally calculating element should rule and do not gauge in faction against it. So remember, this is his definition of temperance, was everyone's everyone's in agreement about who should be in charge. The guardians are like, yeah, we should be in charge. Everybody else is like, yeah, put the guardians in charge. Because we like having money and other things. So similarly, you're a temperate person if all these, if these three parts inside you agree that reason um, and its ally spirit are in charge of the appetites. That kind of makes intuitive sense. Glaucon, 
Temperance in a city and in a private individual is certainly nothing other than that. Socrates. But surely now, a person will be just because of what we have so often described and in the way we have so often described. Glaucon, necessarily... Okay, so justice is not having these three parts inside you do jobs that they were not assigned to. <laughs> what a weird definition. Socrates, well, then is our justice become in any way blurred? Does it look like anything other than the very thing we found in the city? Glaucon, it doesn't seem so to me, at least. Socrates, we can make perfectly sure if there is still anything in our souls that disputes this by applying everyday tests to it. Okay, I like that. I like everyday tests. Glaucon, which ones? Socrates, for example, if we had to come to an agreement about whether a man similar in nature and training to this city of ours would embezzle gold or sil silver he had accepted for deposit, who do you think would consider him more likely to do so than men of a different sort? Okay, so a man similar in nature and training to this ideal city, would he steal the gold? Or would he be more likely to steal the gold than somebody else? Nobody would think that. This is a good, honest gold keeper. Socrates, and would he have anything to do with the temple robberies, thefts, and, or betrayals of friends in private life or of cities in public life? Okay, so it's like, basically, all right, here's the ideal person, and he is constituted like the ideal city. Is he going to do all this bad stuff? Like, is he going to, if he has reason and spirit allied against appetite, uh, is he going to try to get away with murder, basically? And he's saying no. Because I... Maybe it's like you'd only do these crimes if you're kind of giving in to appetites. Um, he has referred to that, that being kind of financed by the money-making part. So in some, in some sense, it makes sense. It's like if you have your appetites under control, you don't really have a motive to steal money. Because you're like, I would just use that money to get, get those pastries. Um, but reason is in control, so I don't really need it. So there's kind of only downside of like, maybe I'll get caught. Glaucon, no nothing. And he would in no way be untrustworthy when it came to promises or other agreements. How could he be? And surely adultery, disrespect for parents, and neglect of the gods would be more characteristic of any other sort of person than of this one. Glaucon, of any other sort indeed. And isn't the reason for all this the fact that each element within him does its own job where ruling and being ruled are concerned? Glaucon, yes, that and nothing else. Are you still looking for justice to be something besides this power that produces men and cities of the sort we have described? No, by Zeus, I am not. Okay, so this is his new definition of justice. It is where reason and spirit rule the appetites. A little, maybe a little bit ascetic. I'm, I don't know. The dream we had has been completely fulfilled then. I mean the suspicion we expressed that right from the beginning when we were founding the city we had with the help of some god chance to hit upon the origin and pattern of justice. Glaucon, absolutely. So Glaucon, it really was, which is why it was so helpful, a sort of image of justice, this principle that it is right for someone who is by nature a shoemaker to practice shoemaking and nothing else, for a carpenter to practice carpentry and the same for all the others. Okay, so this this idea kind of started as an economic one that the shoemaker just sticks to shoemaking so that he becomes an excellent shoemaker. And now he's saying it's kind of a different argument. It's like, oh, well, this is actually a reflection of justice, not just this economic necessity because uh, we don't want reason and appetite interfering with one another. It's kind of a dumb argument because reason and appetite interfering with each other has nothing to do with a shoemaker and a carpenter, like, taking each other's jobs. Um, but I guess he's, he's rolling with it. Glaucon, apparently so. Socrates, and in truth, justice is, it seems, something of this sort. Yet it is not concerned with someone's doing his own job on the outside. On the contrary, it is concerned with what is inside, with himself, really, and the things that are his own. 
It means that he does not allow the elements in him each to do the job of some other, or the three sorts of elements in his soul to meddle with one another. Instead, he regulates well what is really his own, rules himself, puts himself in order, becomes his own friend, and harmonizes the three elements together, just as if they were literally the three defining notes of an octave, lowest, highest, and middle, as well as any others that may be in between. He binds together all of these, and, from having, having been many, becomes entirely one, temperate, and harmonious. Then and only then should he turn to action, whether it is to do something concerning the acquisition of wealth or concerning the care of his body, or even something political, or concerning private contracts. In all these areas he considers and calls just and fine the action that preserves his, this inner harmony and helps achieve it, and wisdom the knowledge that oversees such action. And he considers and calls unjust any action that destroys this harmony in ignorance, the belief that oversees it. Okay, so this is our just man. We found him. He's got the three components, and they're well regulated, and he's temperate and harmonious in everything that he does. Um, he's just, he has kind of inner peace and balance, I guess, and that's the argument for justice. So, as Glaucon had originally argued, like, well, if you're unjust and you're just ripping people off but think you're just, then you get all these like cool benefits. And Socrates is saying, no, that, that person is not, I guess, not, not as happy as the guy who lives a, like, temperate life. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is an interesting idea, because, like, the appetites always kind of run out. You're like, you get on the dopamine treadmill, and you're like, I just need a little more, a little more. And then you're not really happy, like, if you just completely indulge your appetite for food, or appetite for sex, or appetite for alcohol, like... Ultimately, that just usually ends up in people. They're like, oh, I don't, I just did, like, I did everything to the max, and I don't know why I'm still not happy. Um, it's like, well, maybe it's because you need to, you need to work on your internal state of mind, and I just feed, and I just feed those appetites. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is kind of like construing justice uh, it, this way, um, is is compelling in a lot of ways. It's like you can just imagine somebody who's like temperate, has this inner harmony, um, doing things, not kind of ripping off other people because they're comfortable with themselves, as being the happiest sort of person ultimately. Uh, yeah, I mean, and and that for me is kind of regardless of what's going on in this ideal city because. People aren't going to find themselves in ideal cities most of the time. You're just kind of working with the world as it is. Um, and even even this ideal city, as he's construed, it can't really be brought about for like a couple of generations because we it's dependent on this magnificent myth that no one will believe now. But you kind of you kind of have to get the kids early um, in order to persuade them properly. All right, we'll, we'll keep going and see where this goes. Doc, and that's absolutely true, Socrates. Socrates, well, then, if we claim to have found the just man, the just city, and what justice really is in them, we won't, I imagine, be thought to be telling a complete lie. That's interesting. This is a, one place I would like to go to the original Greek and see what he's saying here. Because uh, we talked a lot about lies before and how we have to tell children lies, and how I thought maybe this whole thing is a lie just to keep the city going. Um, so I think it's, it, to me, it's fascinating that he's phrased it this way. He didn't say we found the truth. He's referencing a lie in particular, and he's referencing a complete lie, um, which, I don't know. It, I, I said at the very beginning, maybe there will be hints that he doesn't believe what he's saying here. And this, to me, is a little hint that maybe it is a lie. Just to keep, it's like a nice, it's a nice thought uh, that keeps everybody happy. Like, by Jove, I need to just be temperate in my own affairs. And if you get everybody temperate, um, then you can you can kind of rip everybody off at the at the larger city level. Okay. Gawka, no, by Zeus, we certainly won't. Socrates, shall we claim it then? 
Glaucon, yes, let's. So be it. I take it we must look for injustice next. Whew. Keep going. Glaucon, clearly. Socrates, mustn't it in turn be a kind of faction among those three? They're meddling and interfering with one another's jobs. The rebellion of a part of the soul against the whole in order to rule, it in, rule in it inappropriately, since its nature suits it to be a slave of the ruling class. We will say something like that, I imagine, and that their disorder and wandering is injustice, licentiousness, cowardice, ignorance, and, in a word, the whole of vice. Glaucon, that is precisely what they are. Doing unjust actions, then, and being unjust, and the opposite, doing just ones, they all surely become clear at once, don't they, provided that both injustice and justice are also clear? Yeah, what, what do you mean? That they do not differ in any way from healthy actions and unhealthy ones. That what the latter are in the body, they are in the soul. In what respect? Yeah, Glaucon is following my thought patterns exactly. Socrates, surely healthy actions engender health, unhealthy ones, disease. Sounds about right. Glaucon, yes. Socrates, well... Doesn't doing just actions also engender justice? Unjust ones injustice? Necessarily. Calling, kind of calling back, uh, we're talking about the things in themselves versus their consequences. And I think in book one, it's like, those are the two ways to evaluate something. Socrates. But to produce health is to put the elements that are in the body in their natural relations of mastering and being mastered by one another. While to produce disease is to establish a relation of ruling and being ruled by one that is contrary to nature. I mean, maybe, unless, I don't know, disease is part of nature. I don't, yeah, I, I don't really know how you define a natural relation here, but, okay, I, I could see why the Greeks would think this. Glaucon, that's right. Socrates, doesn't it follow then? that to produce justice is to establish the elements in the soul in a natural relation of mastering and being mastered by one another, while to produce injustice is to establish a relation of ruling and being ruled by one another that is contrary to nature. Oh, yeah, these... Contrary to nature, it's kind of a loaded term these days, because, I don't know, most justifications for, like, persecuting homosexuality is like well that's contrary to nature well who decided what nature was like maybe we're just made of atoms and anything goes i don't know what in accordance with nature actually means and whether there's ever any kind of objective measurement of that but it, it is a beautiful thought and has been very influential throughout western history glaucon absolutely okay so we're saying you're healthy if everything's kind of ordered according to nature in your body and you have a, a just soul if everything in your soul is properly ordered. Uh, okay, Socrates, virtue then, so it seems, is a sort of health, a fine and good state of the soul, whereas vice seems to be a shameful disease and weakness. Glaucon, that's right. And don't fine practices lead to the possession of virtue, shameful ones to vice? Necessarily. Uh, yeah, these are... I don't know how you define these, like a fine practice versus a shameful practice. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, this is very aspirational. It's like, oh, isn't someone whose reason is allied with their spirit to control their appetites? They're just, you'd trust them with money. It's like, well, maybe, but... They also could have conflicting priorities, right? Like, maybe they're going to steal your money to support their family. Is that just? I don't know if they're going to do the just thing. Like, I don't know if they care about me and my money. They, they, we could still fundamentally have a conflict of interest here, even though they seem to be, te like, temperate. Okay. Socrates, so now it remains, it seems, for us to consider whether it is more profitable to do just actions, engage in fine practices, and be just, 
or whether one is known whether one is known to be so or not. So that was the core of Glaucon's argument: is you want to be unjust but seem just. And now Socrates is saying, we're going to show you that being just, whether or not you're known to be so, is profitable. Or to do injustice and be unjust, provided that one does not have to pay the penalty and become a better person as a result of being punished. Okay, so he's saying we're going to show that it's... Yeah, so we're going to compare these. Should you be just or should you be unjust? And we're going to kind of assume the best... Kind of the best case scenario for being unjust, i.e. you don't have to be punished. And the worst case scenario for justice, which is you're not known as being just. Okay, Glaucon says, But Socrates, that question seems to me, at least, to have become ridiculous. Now that the two have been shown to be as we described, life does not seem worth living when the body's natural constitution is ruined. Not even if one has food and drink of every sort, all the money in the world, and every political office imaginable. So how, even if one could do whatever one wished, except what would liberate one from vice and injustice and make one acquire justice and virtue, could it be worth living when the natural constitution of the very thing by which we live is ruined and in turmoil? So, yeah, I, I think he's saying, life, like, the, the question becomes ridiculous because if you, if you are unjust, if your appetites are running the show, then your life is not worth living in the first place. So that, that's kind of how he gets around this. Okay, Socrates. Yes, it is ridiculous. All the same, since in fact we have reached a point from which we can, can see with the utmost clarity, as it were, that these, two, that these things are so, we must not give up. We're getting close to the end. That's absolutely the last thing we should do. Come up here, then, so you can see how many kinds of vice there are, the ones at any rate that are worth seeing. Glaucon, I am following. Just tell me. Socrates, well from the vantage point, so to speak, that we have reached in our, our argument. It seems to me that there is one kind of virtue and an unlimited number of kinds of vice, four of which are worth mentioning. Okay. It's really like that Tolstoy quote, all happy houses are alike, all unhappy houses unhappy in their own particular way. Glaucon, what do you mean? It seems likely there are as many types of soul as there are types of political constitution of a specific kind. Oh boy, where are you going with this, Socrates? How many is that? Five types of constitution and five of soul. Oh boy. Glaucon, tell me what they are. Like, this is just like the Greeks loving to order things. They're just like, they love enumerating things. Like, well, we got five types of this and three types of this and four types of this and seven types of that. Like... They're all just kind of made up, but well, we'll go with it. Socrates, I will tell you that one type would be the constitution we've been describing. However, there are two ways of referring to it. If one outstanding man emerges among the rulers, it is called a kingship. If more than one, it's called an aristocracy. That's true. So I guess... He's built this ideal city, and then he's like, oh yeah, and the ones who are run by one person, that's a kingship. Does that mean that all kingships are these ideal cities? I don't think so. Socrates, well then, that is one of the kinds I had in mind. You see, whether many arise or just one, they won't change any of the laws of the city that are worth mentioning, since they will have been brought up and educated in the way we described. Okay, they're not changing the laws because they received the ideal education. No, they probably won't. Oh, that's the end. Okay. Um, that's a weird place to end the end book. We've got, well, I've got five types of cities that there are. Here's two of them. The end. Okay, um... Well, you know, and again, that's probably just historical reasons the books were divided in this way. Like, they had to write them out on these scrolls, and you couldn't have an infinite scroll, so you had to cut it somewhere. So some monk at some point probably just cut it off there. I don't know if that was the best choice, but there we have it. Okay, that was uh, this exhausting tour of the soul um, here in book four. So we have, like, the most circuitous argument ever uh, to prove that 
we need justice uh, in our hearts. So he, over the course of the last couple books, he constructed the ideal city, and then he said that just as the ideal city has these three component parts that do not intermingle, uh, we also have the soul with three component parts that do not intermingle, and they are the spirit or anger, the appetites, uh, and reason. And reason and spirit need to be the ones running the show. Um, and just in that way, we have the ideal city that's run by the rational and spirited elements, i.e. the guardians, and keeping the, uh, the appetites in check. Um, so, yeah. So, I, all right. So, you, you, I've already kind of said my piece about what I think about all this. I think all this soul stuff is kind of bullshit. Like, it's, it's hard to know what is actually inside our brains without opening it up, and we haven't really been able to open it up. Um, it is believable, though. Um, you can see why this is sort of compelling. You're like, okay, yeah, I could, I could see that. I could, I could feel that the devil and the angel on my shoulders arguing about what I should do. I, I, I feel these internal conflicts, uh, and this seems like a, it's a nice sounding resolution that we have um, reason, reason and spiritedness uh, run, running the show within us, and hopefully in in our ideal city as well. Um, yeah, just to kind of repeat the previous criticisms that I had, they, they still hold here. Like, if we're controlling the appetites of the city, then we don't really need to go to war, and so we still don't need, really need these guardians. Um, and, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I'll, we'll, we'll see where Socrates uh, continues with, uh, with these arguments and how this city is actually going to be constructed. The last thing I'll, I will reiterate is the role of the lie in all of this and the role of errors. So it's, they were big in the first two books, and then kind of disappear from the scene. He did use this phrase that we will not be said to be saying a complete lie. And is there significance to using the phrase complete lie in reference to everything, all of the foregoing? Maybe there is. Maybe I'm reading too much into that. Um, but I, I do think that we have been attuned to this idea that we need these, these myths. And maybe the myths about souls are just as important as the myths about ourselves and our personal identity and kind of the origin um, of this state. So, you know, maybe, maybe we need all of these to just kind of, kind of keep everything together and keep it, keep revolution at bay, uh, which was one of the things he kind of casually mentioned, like, oh, we can't have too much money because that'll lead to revolution. Can't too have, have too much poverty, that'll lead to revolution. Uh, so in some ways, this is a very radical uh, pr set of proposals. In other ways, it's a very conservative set of proposals. It's like, here, we want to keep, we want to maintain a city-state that remains in power. Uh, so in some ways, it is about preserving the power, the power structures after they've, after they've been set up. And it all kind of stems out of this ideal education uh, being passed forward um, in time. So there we, ha we have a definition of justice finally. Uh, so that's something we can hang our hats on. And we'll see, I have no idea where he's going to go for the rest of this book. Now these, he seems to have satisfied himself, uh, that justice, justice is possible, uh, through this sort of mental construction about what's the, the tripartite nature of your soul. All right. That's all I'm going to say. This video has gone on, uh, long enough as it is. If you're enjoying this, Hit the old subscribe button, um, hit the like button, and uh, come come back for book five. Oh, I guess, yeah, we have six more books. Uh, yeah, come back for book five. See you tomorrow.